Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. For those of you who were not here earlier, uh, I'm going to be your host for this session. My name is Candelaria. Um, if you have any problem or if you need anything, please let me know. I'm going to be sitting right here at the front. Um, we're going to have uh, three talks uh, in this session. And first, we're going to start with this um, talk about multimedia overview. <coughs> um, I want to encourage you to tweet and share uh, anything you find interesting with the hashtag uh, Wikimania2014. And yeah, without further ado, I leave the floor to our first speaker. And thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Fabrice Florin. I'm product manager for the multimedia team at the Wikimedia Foundation. And I'm Gilles Dubuque, senior developer on that team. And we're gonna give you a quick overview of what we're working on on the multimedia team to improve the media experience on uh, Commons, Wikipedia, and other sites. Um, so we have about a half an hour. Uh, what we'd like to do is introduce three projects that are going to be major projects for us this year. Upload Wizard, Structured Data, and Media Viewer. Each of these projects addresses a different part of uh, the uh, media experience on our sites. Uh, Upload lets you uh, essentially import pictures into the uh, environment. Structured data is a better way to store file information about media files. And Media Viewer improves the viewing experience for all users. Um, so we're going to start with the Upload Wizard, uh, which is essentially the way that people contribute media files to our uh, various wikis. And we aim to upgrade, uh, upload, sorry, upgrade the existing Upload Wizard to engage more users to contribute media, make it easier to add useful media to our sites and provide a smoother experience that we provide today. This will be the main uh, user-facing project for our team this year. Uh, and we're going to focus on the needs of both casual and experienced users. Um, the current wizard, um, while uh, it's uh, pretty useful, um, could be improved in a variety of ways. I'm gonna take you through the current upload process as it stands today, and then Jill's gonna show you how we propose to improve it. So currently you go to Wikimedia Commons, and for those of you who don't know, Wikimedia Commons <coughs> is the file repository for all media files across all of the wikis uh, that we serve. Um, so um, this is the place where you can uh, upload media that you're interested in, and this is the first screen that is given to you, is to select media files to share. You can then <coughs> uh, upload them you know, from your uh, computer or from your mobile phone. Uh, right now we're looking at the desktop view of the upload uh, pipeline. Then your files are uploaded and a little check mark appears to let you know that they have been uploaded. And then you're asked to uh, describe uh, and provide information about yourself or the author and the source of uh, the file, as well as the license information. And it can be a little daunting for some people. And so we're going to you know, look for ways to you know, make this a little bit easier for folks uh, so they have better understanding of, of which license to pick, for example. Um, the uh, next step is once you've filled in this information, you're asked to um, provide a title or description. You can add uh, other information, such as location or categories. And then the last step is uh, uh, basically using this file, either on an article on Wikipedia or 
on your own site and then some links are provided. So while this uh, process is uh, workable today and millions of files uh, are, are being contributed to our sites, we think it can be improved. And I'm going to turn it over to Gilles to let you know how we uh, propose to improve it in the uh, coming months and years. So here are some ideas that we've been working on for a, a more modern version of Apple Wizard. Um, first of all, we'd like to provide more simplified instructions to people who land on the wizard. Currently, there's a big infographic that's a bit complicated and can be daunting for new users to understand. So we're, we want to work on simplifying this. Uh, we want, also want the tool to be a bit more modern and support drag and drop and features like this. Um, Another main thing for us is to try and make the process more efficient time-wise. For example, something that the current wizard could not do is allow people to enter metadata and describe the file while it's being uploaded. Um, so at the moment it takes a lot of time because you have to wait for the file to be fully uploaded before you can enter that. So the new wizard would allow you to do both at the same time. Um, we also want to have <coughs> smarter defaults uh, to have better tools to propagate similar information between multiple files making, being uploaded in the same batch. We want to support uh, people coming back to the wizard and finding uh, settings the way they left it the last time they used it in similar, smarter ways to improve the process for users so that they don't have to spend as much time entering the information. Uh, and we also want to work on providing smart suggestions during the upload based on the file, based on what the user has done before, again, to try and just make that whole process a lot faster. So go ahead. Yes, a lot of inspiration comes from Commonist. We had that feedback yesterday, and uh, this is the kind of feature that people like on uh, alternative tools, and we want to bring them into the wizard. Um, and once the upload is successful, we'd like it to not feel like a dead end, like it does currently. So this is just an idea we probably want to do more into this, which is to try and uh, direct users to go and do something with the file, not just stop there once the file is uploaded. Um, so yeah, this is a summary of what I just said. And now we have open questions and we invite the audience to participate. Um, so you know, first of all, maybe a quick show of hands, how many people use Apple Wizard? Good. <laughs> Uh, so then the question would be, why do you use it? What are your problems with it? Go ahead. So, uh, basically, I'm a common mm -hmm. and I usually use the visual interface. Uh, so, I upload the visual interface and then some videos and some stuff that I upload. If it's a visual update, I never use it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very cool and very hard to use. Uh, when you do a big dash, so mm -hmm. you should write a script. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, we've had feedback that we so first of all we want to open we want to open uh, Flickr upload to more people on the comments because we've heard other comments admins saying that they wanted that so we're going to make that happen. Um, and on this note of Apple Wizard not covering all use cases, I don't think that the new version will try to cover all use cases. I personally am more in favor of having better dedicated tools for different tasks. Uh, for example, yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, one of them would be, for example, to maybe code-wise separate Flickr upload experience and try and work on improving, improving this use case with things that work for that workflow, like for instance, having a lot of pictures to swap through and really <coughs> keep some of them in an efficient way, which is not the same as picking images from your computer and wanting to upload all of them. And if you're really smart, speaking of images, I think about the Flickr, uh, the review is done after the file is uploaded, which is a waste of time. Yes. And, and, and <laughs> you should file the review before you upload, and then you don't need to move, yeah. move over on the file. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to take like one or two more comments, but I'd like to point out that we have an ether pad. Uh, and the link is provided at the bottom of the screen. And we encourage you all, if you have a laptop, to chime in and add questions or comments <coughs> on the Etherpad. It's very useful to us because then we can go back home and just look at everything that you've provided, even if we couldn't take all your questions. Uh, I also want to point out one more thing, is that if anybody's interested in exploring some of these issues in depth outside of this overview, uh, we have a multimedia roundtable on Sunday at 11.30. I believe it's uh, 
in uh, the boardroom. And uh, you're welcome to sign up for that session as well. It's limited to 24 people, so sign up early if you want to be part of it. So let's take one more question about Upload Wizard. So what exactly do you mean by a smart default? Um, just things that would be based on your user activity, for example, uh, if you're, uh, you know, if you've used the tool before so or other like tools. Your, uh, own work, will that be a smart default? Probably yes, uh, for what people for what the user is being used at the moment, and you know, many, maybe, but that's something you can figure out with the community. We don't want to make the decision that we think uh, this is the best default for comments, for example. Maybe comments can decide that for themselves. Uh, we just want to, you know, uh, it could be optional, and uh, each community okay, could define it. I have just one statement that the, um, I mean, a very good number of uh, uh, people who upload images. They put it uh, under own work, even under the current upload wizard, even if the image is copyrighted. Mm -hmm. So if you make it simpler uh, to, you know, just uh, if its default is that uh, it's uh, own work, then people won't even notice that uh, it's supposed to be, you know, taken by you to be your own work. Yeah. We're, we're aware that uh, we need to provide more guidance to users so that they understand you mm -hmm. know, what is appropriate, and that's what the smart suggestions would be for, particularly on mobile. We're finding a lot of people upload things on mobile not really <coughs> knowing what the rules of engagement are, and it causes a lot of their files to be deleted. So the importance of guiding people properly is, 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 is really essential for this tool. Um, so um, I'm sure there's a lot of fantastic questions about this, but in the interest of time, since this is just an overview, we're going to move on to the next one, but again, please uh, add your comments and questions on the Etherpad. So the next project is called Structured Data, uh, and we're doing this in collaboration with the Wikidata team um, in order to bring uh, better ways to um, uh, store information about the files that are on commons. Right now, <laughs> the data is in plain text, it's unstructured. So it's difficult to uh, sort or find information until it becomes machine readable. This will make it easier for users to read and write uh, file info, and it'll be much easier for developers to build better tools for multimedia. And this, of course, impacts all of our users. Uh, initially, uh, power users will be involved uh, early on, but uh, there are so many uh, use cases that will benefit from this. Um, <coughs> So for example, this could uh, help people find more relevant content, it can drive editing, provide new ways to contribute with people doing curation and metadata, not just contributing files, and overall it'll improve our infrastructure. Um, so the applications range from search to uh, viewing, editing, curating, and we're just gonna give you a couple examples. Uh, so for example, right now, search, if you type in the word orange on commons, you get all sorts of things that are not necessarily oranges, uh, the fruit, um, and it might be helpful if we gave you ways to triangulate a little bit more. So for example, uh, you might be able to enter multiple topics, like in this slide you can see bird migration in Canada, to you know, basically narrow down your search and get images that are more relevant to what you're looking for. Um, another application of structured data is, for example, if you're looking at an image of the girl with a pure, uh, pearl earring. Uh, you can find out information about uh, Johannes Vermeer, the, uh, the painter, um, which is already contained in Wikidata. And it, we can leverage the power of Wikidata to provide more relevant information about the uh, images that you're looking at. Um, in another application <coughs> of uh, structured data would be the ability to edit information uh, from other pages. So for example, let's say you're on uh, Wikipedia and you see an image that doesn't have a description. You would be able to enter the description on Wikipedia, have it stored on Wikimedia Commons, which is our file repository, and structured data makes this possible. So it really broadens the scope and the quality of the contributions that you can make uh, to our uh, environment. So I'm gonna let uh, Gilles describe a little bit more about uh, this project. Um, so this is just an example of a you know, sample image that we'll be working with and we're also looking at other media types, trying to figure out what kind of uh, fields we're going to want to define. And at the moment we have this working model which we're developing with Wikidata in Germany uh, to try and figure out patterns that could apply to the very uh, different use cases that people would use structured data for. And we'll also be engaging with Europeana and other 
uh, foundations and uh, interested parties from the community to allow us to define a model that would fit for pretty much any media type. So the idea here is that you have a general file, you could have one or more works, the, for example, if it's a photo of a painting, there would be two works, the photo and the painting. Uh, several contributors uh, with different roles, uh, one or more licenses, many different topics. The goal being that we have a very flexible model that we hope could fit with <coughs> the very complex cases uh, that uh, people deal with on Commons at the moment. Um, and this is work in progress and we have, we're having meetings uh, regularly with the interested parties to try and tune that and come up with something that, that's really going to work in the future. This is an example of how you could encounter uh, structured data in the future, starting from an article, landing on the file page in comments that contains all the structured data details, maybe exploring further those semantic uh, data points and ending up on Wikidata. Um, so all these parts will work together. Um, this is just an overview of our storage uh, strategy. Uh, some of the information we stored on comments, some on Wikidata, and some on Commons Media Wiki. Um, so we're going to use Wikibase on Commons, which is the technology behind Wikidata, to store uh, semantic information about the files. The reason why we're storing this in different places is that uh, Wikidata has its own goals uh, about uh, meaningful items uh, that are universally known, whereas a given file in itself might not be something that the world cares about, so which is why we have to store uh, different data in different places. For instance, with the previous example, the painting would be stored on Wikidata, but the photos of the painting's information would be on Commons. Next steps. So uh, we are actively discussing this with the community, and the reason why we're presenting this today is that anybody who's interested could chime in, uh, and same for Sunday. Um, our goal really this right, right now is to design a structure that's really going to work for all the use cases, and uh, our strategy is to develop tools that will help the community migrate the data. We don't want to make the mistake of automatically migrating data that might not be accurate as it stands and, and just perpetuate uh, wrong information in a structured way. And so um, we want to create a really powerful tool that will help people uh, do this migration through bots, manually, etc., so that the final structured data is the cleaned up version of everything that's unstructured at the moment. Um, well, this is just no really different parameters, but I see a lot of questions, we'll just check the questions. Uh, let's take this one uh, over yeah. there, please. Uh, my first question is, uh, why limit yourself to a certain number of fields? Why not allow every field in the data to use in this manner? Well, and the first, I, the first example that I have in mind are the, the monument codes just for Wikipedia monuments. These are, these are present in Wikipedia. Yes. And we could use them in uh, we could use them in, uh, in Commons as well. Yes. Well, the idea is that you can link to anything on Wikidata, any okay. item. Because from the presentation, uh, my understanding was that we only have a subset of fields. Uh, so a lot of these fields are actually links to Wikidata, and we want to allow people to link either to Wikidata or URL or very different <laughs> things. So a lot of this is very flexible, uh, and obviously the community will be involved in extending the set of links that we define or the set of fields. This is not fixed at all. Okay, so there will be support in the software for anything? Yes, the Wikibase itself supports any amount of fields. It will be a community issue to decide which ones there are and when we extend them, etc. So, <laughs> I'll go back to you. Um, sort of implicit in some of the slides was maybe the creation of tags or a tag-like system for indexing images. Well, that is part of that, that the categories will be phased out on Commons? So there's a whole discussion about that <coughs> specifically. Um, Wikidata is focused on, on this issue, and their idea is to extract topics from the existing categories. For example, if you have a category which is trees in London, this will be the cross-section of the tree topic and the London topic, because the search tools that we hope to develop with this will allow to do this kind of multi-topic search, which is, you know, people are hacking categories together because they cannot do that at the moment. And the idea is to try and convert the categories to multi-topic uh, storage. 
to just to follow up. Uh, if I suppose you want the image of Earth and Moon together, so if I put the topics Earth and Moon, will that all the images of that uh, category will pop, uh, open up in the search? It would do the, well, I'm sure it will develop many different search tools, but you probably be able to do inclusion, exclusion, etc. So, you know, uh, the idea is that we index the information in a structured manner, and then people will be able to do any kind of search they want. So the intent, to be clear, is to continue to support categories as they stand today, but to add, in addition to that, topics, right. so you can have even richer search above and beyond. <coughs> yeah, they'll coexist for a while. You know, we don't want to just turn a switch and say categories are gone. Uh, because they have different use at the moment. Um, so on the uh, category topic, um, so you talked about tools. Will those tools help to extract the metadata that is within categories already? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, we have already developed tools for MediaViewer that actually parse the wiki text that's on comments to extract licensing information and things like that from it. So yes, we want to facilitate uh, a best guess of the existing data and then maybe have a manual pass of people reviewing what the tools say to check that it's correct. Another admin question. Uh, you said that staff will go on uh, various places. So, for example, someone uploaded something that needs to be deleted, they need to go to several places to reverse it? No, 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 no. You'll do that from one place. You know, the, the goal is for all these pieces to work together. So, the wiki base will be integrated into comments. So yes. Not really, because what would be stored in Wikidata would be um, general information about a painting, about a monument, uh, about a place, and so um, you wouldn't have to delete that because those things still exist. Well, the artwork it's itself. Wrong on comments, yes. Not to revert that change. Yeah. I can do it on comments. That's the goal. That's the idea. And if if there's wrong information in Wikidata, you might have to go to Wikidata if you want to correct that. But they're covering different topics. The file itself that you're dealing with, most of it will be stored on comments and on comments wiki base. So yes, you'd be doing that work on comments. Great. So we'll explore this topic in more depth on Sunday during the multiple <coughs> round table. And we encourage you to sign up while there's still uh, room on that uh, session. And we're going to move on to our next project now, which is Media Viewer. Uh, some of you may have already uh, experienced the Media Viewer that has been deployed in recent months. Uh, the goal of that project was to offer a better viewing experience uh, with a focus on readers and we developed a variety of features um, which we'll uh, go over a little bit later in the demonstration. Um, again, the focus is on casual users um, and um, we um, tried to address a number of issues with the current file page which is not ideal from a reader's perspective. It's a little bit cluttered. And, it's got a lot of info, it's on a separate page, on a separate site, sometimes there's a duplicate page, uh, it takes a while to load and the design is a little bit outdated. So the intent was to provide the readers with a preview capability um, before going to <coughs> the file page uh, because most readers just want basic information, they don't want so much uh, information. And so you can see right now what the file page looks like on a small screen, you've got to do a lot of scrolling to get to the information. Instead, we design a much more compact layout that's much more suited for casual browsing of images and more useful to uh, the readers uh, whom we serve. Uh, but we also provide a way for uh, uh, editors to go either bypass the media viewer or um, go, s go to the, the file page uh, from the media viewer. So for example, if we do a quick demo, um, here we are on the Golden Crown Sparrow page. You, know, you click on uh, the uh, thumbnail, the uh, media viewer appears. You've got a variety of features. If you want to, you can go like in full screen mode and just really reduce all of the clutter and be able to browse through the various images um, in a very pleasant way that sort of matches user expectations for multimedia nowadays. And then of course, at any point, you can kind of uh, close, close down the, the full screen feature. Um, you can, if you want to, zoom in by just going to the original image and zooming in in your browser. If you want more information about the image besides uh, uh, what's there, you can open it up and, and offer more information. Uh, but that's a little bit daunting in the current version, again, for the, uh, for, for the average reader. Um, so we're going to look to ways to sort of uh, uh, streamline that a little bit. If you are interested in using this file, you can um, you know, either uh, embed the image in an article in either Wikitext or in HTML. It contains all of the 
required attributions for the author and for the licenses. You can simply share that, just grab a link that you can send to somebody and it'll open up in Media Viewer. Or if you want to, you can download uh, the file in a variety of sizes. Um, and then again, there's always a reminder to attribute the author, which is a really ins essential requirement that uh, sometimes people forget about it. And then last but not least, of course, you can jump to the file page on Wikimedia Commons. We're going to make this button a lot more prominent so that people have a better understanding about what the difference is between um, uh, the media viewer and the file page and give them a better sense of uh, what their viewing options are. Um, now, we've uh, done uh, quite a bit of research since the, the product has been launched. And um, right now, we're basically logging uh, somewhere on the order of 20 to 24 million image views per day on the media viewer on the 27 sites that we monitor. Uh, some of the most frequent actions besides thumbnail clicks are next and previous. People are using next and previous as much as they're clicking on thumbnails. So clearly, users are finding this browsing capability useful. Um, and then we're kind of monitoring what people click on and what they like in order to calibrate the tool to better meet the user needs. Um, we've also monitored the disable rates, see how many people disable as an indication of the acceptance. <coughs> disable rates are extremely low for your average logged in user, 0.36. Uh, percent do it, but it's a little bit higher for power users. Uh, and if for very active users, it's even higher. So it's an indication that for active editors, the tool is not as useful as it is for readers. And so we're going to provide a number of ways to address this in the next version of, of the product. Uh, we ran surveys for a couple months. We collected about 18,000 uh, responses in eight different languages. And overall, we see that there's a majority of users who find the media viewer useful. Uh, again, they tend to be readers more than power users. Uh, but more importantly, we learned a number of things from these surveys. We were able to quantify which of the um, user requests were most important. A lot of people want Zoom and access to different image sizes. So we're going to take that, those in consideration. A lot of people want an easier way to opt out um, and be able to find information more easily. And so we'll address those as well. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Gilles to talk about some of the improvements. So uh, development of MiniViewer doesn't stop. And we're, uh, based on the feedback we've received, we're exploring a better division of concerns between MiniViewer and file page. At the moment, there's a bit of crossover in terms of the metadata that was displayed, and we want to reduce that so that MiniViewer is more focused on the media itself and the file page on the metadata. Um, so we've done another study of basically the diff different use cases to readers and the editors. Even readers that do more research might be more interested in the file page information. It depends on what you're doing on the site, basically. Um, and this is a, a screenshot of a working prototype that we're testing at the moment, where the area below the fold is gone. We don't display the uh, simplified metadata that was there before. You understand that a lot of editors didn't like the simplification that we did. <coughs> And we have a much more prominent button going straight to the file page to show the metadata as it was put together by the editors. Uh, we still have a uh, caption that's expandable at the bottom, uh, general attribution information, and a link to the license if needed. Um, a much more prominent uh, cog icon at the top that allows you to turn it off if you don't want it. Uh, at, the bottom, at the moment, it's a link at the very bottom, and people are complaining that may not find it. So. We put it right there. If people don't like the MIDI viewer, they can turn it off uh, very quickly. And a number of shortcut functions at the bottom right, they used to be inside a uh, pop-up that are now separated into different direct, a direct access features. And this is an example of what it looks like if you open the large caption or description and need to read what's there, which is the only case left for the bottom section to expand. Sorry? Oh, it, oh yes, there's a link on the presentation. You can go and try it. We have an alpha server on on um, on labs that runs the. It's it's experimental. You know, we can expect to see bugs in it, but it has the new layout. So now questions about MediaViewer. You mentioned that uh, the number of uh, image views were 20 million per day on the 27 sites that we monitor. Uh, is this count uh, included in some published statistics, like uh, stuff 
uh, it's, it's a LIM dashboard, it, it's public, we can give you the link. It's uh, linked on all of our media viewer pages, and it's also linked on this presentation. We will make this presentation available. But the, but the per, per image, per image. ones. Ah, no, not per, we don't have per image information. Which images are viewed and not? So that's what I want to do. No, that, we're not studying that at the moment. It's, it's in the works for this year to uh, provide more image view information. And again, there's an opportunity to collaborate with uh, folks like Europeana to make this available. The GLAMs are asking yeah. for that specifically. Yeah. So we're, we're aware of this, and it's definitely on the roadmap. We don't know when it will be practical for us to implement it. <coughs> What are the plans about uh, the structured metadata that we talked about just before? Well, the plan is to feed it to many viewers. <laughs> so, uh, so maybe when actually when the structured data project has gone all the way through, and we have excellent structure on the file page, we might be able to bring some of that back to many viewer. I think the main issue we have right now is the way we extract information uh, automatically can be inaccurate, and so a lot of editors were <coughs> upset that the information shown is about many viewer and maybe a few percent of the cases was incorrect. And with structured data, we won't have that problem anymore. You might even be able to edit it right there in Media Viewer in the future. Just out of curiosity, um, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, but um, what the impression I'm getting from the presentation is very much an active approach. We are going to do this, we are going to do that, we are going to do that. We're building this tool, we're uh, creating this awesome idea. And I was wondering, um, how is the, the balance between creating stuff yourself and enabling volunteer developers to create something, to build upon your, uh, your structure? Well, we're always very inviting people to contribute to the code base, and uh, on MediaViewer, which is the one that we've completed to an extent, uh, we've kept that in mind and we've tried to make the code as modular as possible to allow external people to uh, to build upon it and hook into it. We had a discussion yesterday uh, with someone. Uh, the best thing to do if you're a gadget developer is to really uh, go and submit patches directly to the extension itself if you want to add hooks for your gadget. That's really the simplest way to go about it. And we'll be very active in reviewing. So if you come to us and even ask questions on the mailing list and how you can do whatever you want to add to be the viewer will help you figure out how to do that. Uh, it happens on more on the older ones, surprisingly on uh, Google Wizard we get a lot of uh, volunteer contributions. Media viewer not so much because it's new, I guess. Um, but yes, I mean, uh, my, one of my roles as a senior developer is to facilitate all these external reviews and I always try to never let people be blocked and wait too long for us to give feedback. So, and the structured data project is going to be very collaborative. Already, we're involving Wikidata and many other uh, developers. Magnus Mensky has expressed interest <coughs> in contributing to the project. So that's going to be an area which will be really prolific uh, community contribution. Yes. One thing that I do is I add a lot of photographs of buildings, and at the moment I upload you up as well as adding this happy plastic to the building. I'm having to add the location coordinates. Now you can say that's really both those things are the same thing, because for most buildings they've got a pretty specific, mm -hmm. a relatively small geographical area. Should I, should I stop uploading one of those two elements? Because it's not, it's duplication. In the future, you would be creating, if it doesn't exist yet, a Wikidata item for that location, and that item would contain name, coordinates, etc. And so when uploading your image, you'd just be searching for the Wikidata item for that building and just selecting it, and that would be all. But for the time being, I should still continue? Yes. So, <laughs> I, can, I can see the eventual able to remove one of those things. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Well, we want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, we encourage you to uh, learn more about these projects on our multimedia page. Um, if you are interested in multimedia and want to stay involved in uh, this conversation, uh, you can sign up to our multimedia mailing list. It's a great way to stay in touch with us. And again, if you have an interest in uh, digging into some of these issues in depth, uh, please sign up to the uh, multimedia roundtable on Sunday. Uh, while, uh, and for unanswered questions, come see us after the presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks for coming, folks. Uh, how many people were at the morning video session that were here? Okay, great. A little bit of a overlap with what I talked about, but not that much. Um, my name is Andrew Lee. I'm a professor of journalism at uh, American University. So I've given this talk, uh, uh, portions of this talk, at the Wikiconf in USA, the Wikiconf USA in New York City. But uh, I wanted to make sure we had a wider audience to talk about some of these things. So I want to make sure we had plenty of time at the end to talk about video issues. And Brian's going to follow me with some really cool experiments that he's been doing um, to try to solve the problems that I'll be talking about here. Um, if you don't know, I wrote a book about Wikipedia called The Wikipedia Revolution. Um, and now I am mainly doing video training of journalists uh, specifically for online collaboration. And certainly Wikipedia is one of the, the biggest and most interesting places where this could happen. So my work this next year is basically looking at Wikipedia as a potential for great video storytelling. But how many videos in Wikipedia actually have articles? And you may not know this, because when's the last time you saw a video in a Wikipedia article? Uh, what's that? Yesterday. But you're a rare, rare beast. <laughs> most of the times I give this talk, everyone says, Wait a minute, Th they're videos? Or why aren't there more videos in Wikipedia, right? So the rough number, it's actually not easy to count because you don't have a great description of what is video. If it's an AUG, is it audio? Is it video? Um, are animated GIFs videos? There's plenty of animated GIFs, but would you call them video? Not sure. So somewhere between four to 6,000 uh, videos are in the English language Wikipedia as, in terms of embedded in articles. That's only about 1.1%. And if you do a spot check, if you randomly check these videos, they're actually not very good quality. Some of them are five second, just little blips. Um, very few of them are well composed, have a storyline, tell you something comprehensive about what's going on there. So that's the, the challenge, is that we actually have a lot of interesting folks doing great video work on YouTube, on Vimeo, on other types of uh, online communities, but they're not making it into Wikipedia, they're not taking root in Wikipedia, and why is this? Well, we have some good um, explanations for why this might be, but the need for it is really there. So I would argue that when you look at the article on soccer or football or association football or dance or waltz or salsa, you should be seeing a video of these things. You shouldn't be seeing stills or descriptions of how you dance, right? Um, but there actually is kind of an anti uh, anti-video stance in Wikipedia in general. As my students over the last two years have tried to incorporate video into articles, the kinds of pushback from established Wikipedia editors is quite astonishing. Um, so there is this kind of intellectual snobbery that we have in Wikipedia saying that video is for, you know, uh, very basic and, and uninformed folks and text is where the real intellect is. And I'd like to push back on that. So these are actually two areas where Britannica and Carter actually 
were better than Wikipedia. If you've ever gotten the Encarta and Britannica DVDs, they had really great multimedia timelines, they had video, mainly because they're willing to pay to license those things, or because Microsoft was the publisher of Encarta and Bill Gates owns the largest <laughs> video and photo archive in the world, they were able to get footage um, for those encyclopedias at, at a rate that was uh, much more reasonable than perhaps other encyclopedias out there. So we'd like to try to see how we can change this culture in Wikipedia. So one of the cool things about um, working on this project is that Ward Cunningham, just by coincidence, was working on something similar. And he just happened to be CTO of a company at the time for about six months called um, Citizen Global. And the, the goal of this company was to try to create a mobile video collaborative workforce that people could actually shoot video, upload, and collaborate on the editing process. Now, this is not new. They've been trying to do this since the 1990s with MTV experiments and things like that, but we've never really been able to do good video collaboration. And over these conversations that I had with Ward, while he was trying to solve his problem and I was trying to solve my problem, we realized we kind of hit on the same thing, that actually the goal of Citizen Global, his company, in trying to do a footage call to the crowd to get contributions and make good content was actually not succeeding because people didn't have a good sense of visual literacy and actually video shooting and editing is actually quite hard. And the reason why is because if we look at text contributions and when we learn to read, we kind of learn how to write at the same time, right? You have pretty good insights into how to write if you learn how to read. But on the other hand, for video, you need absolutely no training whatsoever to watch video, to understand something, to appreciate good filmmaking and good video storytelling. On the other hand, to produce video, you need a lot of experience, you need a lot of training, you need a lot of skill and maybe technical tools at the same time. I have three and a half year old twins and I know this for a fact. You know, you just put them in front of the TV, they just start learning that vi through video right away. But to create video, watching and appreciating good video does not really give you good insight into how to create good video. Right? So one of the things that we tried to do um, with this project um, which I'll talk about in a second, Wiki Makes Video, is to understand that video is hard and we want to try to address the common problems in teaching video storytelling. So one of the things that we found that really helps a lot is what we use in the journalism field to teach people who aren't video journalists how to do video journalism. Right? So this is something that we call the BBC Five Shot Method. And it's a very simple method um, that we think is kind of a universal way to start storytelling. And then once you pick up this method, you can branch out very quickly into other types of video storytelling. And the reason why Ward kind of saw this approach and said, this is great because this is a pattern, right? You know Ward always thinks in patterns and programming. And he said, the way that you teach video journalism in journalism schools is a pattern. And if you can take that paradigm of the pattern and start to build it out more, you can actually uh, work within the wiki community in similar ways. So what are these video patterns? Well, oops, let me see if I have audio here. Do we have audio? Coming off of the uh, dais here. Worst case, you could put the microphone on your speaker. That might do the trick. We could. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I do have a speaker. Hold on a second. Speaker. Hello. Yes. Let's see if we can get up here. You have your bag of tricks. You have my bag of tricks. <laughs> <laughs> my bag of tricks. <laughs> so we do have this mini little. Speaker here. Ooh. What's that? Hopefully not next to the microphone. Not next to the microphone. You're so organized, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's only if I can find it. So, uh, this is the best part. Of the, uh, this is the best part. <laughs> that's true multimedia for you. <laughs> yeah. Stupid uh, multimedia tricks here. And this is how they take videos. This is how hard video is, right? So. Uh, yes, we have it. This is why it's called multi yes. So let's try this. <coughs> so this is kind of funny. I, I've shown this several times at Wikimania, but I, I couldn't resist because we were actually in the UK. How can I not show a BBC clip <laughs> in the UK? So this is funny. This is a, a show called Newswipe, and they make fun of mainstream media. But this is great because they perfectly broke down what we know is kind of the cliche news story in um, I hope this works. In, in the news industry, I'm sure you'll recognize this when you see it. So hopefully, let's play this out. Before long, a standard news report visual language established itself, one that's immediately recognizable to anyone. Me has this report. 
It starts here with a lacklustre establishing shot of a significant location. Next, a walkie-talkie preamble from the auteur, pacing steadily towards the lens, punctuating every other sentence with a hand gesture and ignoring all the pricks milling around him like he's gliding through the fucking matrix before coming to a halt and posing a question. What comes next? Often something like this, a filler shot designed to give your eyes something to look at while my voice babbles on about facts. Sometimes it'll slow down to a halt, turn monochrome, and some of those facts will appear one by one on the screen. This is followed by the obligatory shots of overweight people with their faces subtly framed out, after which the report is padded out with a selection of lazy and pointless vox pops. Um, usually get some inane chatter from people. I think they do have too much. I think what we want to hear is actually what's happening and not what other people think of it. I, I hate this. I, I don't want some punter's opinion usually. No. Another bit of dull visual abstraction to plug another gap now before the report segues gracefully into a bit of human interest courtesy of some dowdy man opening letters in a kitchen and explaining how he's been affected by the issue. When I'm watching the news, I don't really, you know, there's a person talking to me telling me what's going on and I don't really listen to what they're saying. It's just news. It's just news. He, unfortunately, was boring, so to wake you up, this is an animated chart, this is a silhouette representing the average family, and this is a lighthouse keeper being beheaded by a laser beam. As we near the end of the report, illustrative shots of pedestrians and signs and a pipe at a window, and then the final summary, ending on a whimsical shot of something nearby, accompanied by a wry sign-off. If you're lucky, a bit of wordplay fit for a king, or in other words, a regent's treat. Charlie Brooker, Newswipe, London. <laughs> All right. So, so I, I couldn't resist, but you know, you can see that when you see that piece, you're kind of slightly offended that you've been fed the same kind of story over and over and over and over again over the years. But it just shows that, at least in the field of journalism, there is a pattern to doing video quickly and getting news stories out to folks, right? So videos are not just made out of magic or made in a in a way that you make art, it actually has patterns, it has a grammar, it has a progression, it has a three-act structure that we're used to. And if we get people more educated on those things, then we can actually get further down the line in training them. So that's what we really want to do with this Wikibakes video project, is to bring some of these journalistic storytelling techniques to the greater Wikipedia community to learn how to do this. So I to my students create three different things that you could do here. You could either shoot your own video, which is actually not that easy because of some of the standards things we'll talk about in a second. You can clip video, which might be easier. You can go to existing sources like National Archives, Internet Archive, um, places that have either PD or Creative Commons videos and at least splice things together, even just embed a clip that exists already just to um, sort out video and put it in relevant articles. Or you can suggest, even if you're completely mystified by this, just please at least recommend articles that really could use video, right? So those are just kind of very three simple things. And by working with students, we realize that there's so many things you can do with video, we really need to simplify it into um, buckets that people could participate in. So the BBC Five Shot Method um, is something that they used to train, they used it originally to train print journalists how to do video. Um, a lot of folks who do video journalism might have learned the craft in film school or some other type of uh, method, but to get print journalists to do video journalism very quickly, they basically recommended this method, which is finding a human subject, regardless of whether the story is about <laughs> generically economics or something else, but to find a human subject and start with a close-up on the hands first, a close-up on the face second, and then a wide shot of where things are happening, and then an over-the-shoulder shot as the fourth shot. Uh, to kind of bring all those three elements together. And the reason why this is a great method is that unlike a lot of boring video that you probably saw from your Uncle Murray and when he shot your birthday party, you don't just want the video wide and shooting generically around and swaying and recording what's in the room. You actually want a progression of video or visual shots that tell a story, that have a narrative. And this is a, the most basic narrative you can have, right? The first shot says, what's going on? You're looking at the hands. The second one says who's doing it. The third shot shows where it's happening. And the fourth one ties it all together. So in four shots, you've answered four questions. And if you can get someone hooked into the video that quickly, you've already won in terms of effective storytelling. Right? So this was very useful in training journalists. And we've been using this method with a number of classes that have tried to use video in Wikipedia, including my own, and ones at Alverno College in Wisconsin. So how do we get 
folks to use more of this on Wikipedia. As we said, we took the original project, which was called Lights Camera Wiki, and renamed it Wiki Makes Video. And, and we wanted to challenge folks to try to make video quickly with this uh, method. So as I mentioned, Alverno College annually has a class on media literacy where uh, Jenny McCauley gets her students to shoot little uh, tutorials or how-tos for Wikipedia. Um, and then my glam-oriented classes I've been doing recently, I've had my students go to the Smithsonian and shoot B-roll there. So there's a weird, uh, 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 an interesting uh, part of this that is uh, related to intellectual property, there's a strange phenomenon with the Smithsonian Museums that for whatever reason they signed a contract so that the Smithsonian TV channel has first rights to shoot anything in the museums. So you actually cannot have professional TV crews go in and shoot high quality videos of the content there. But there's nothing stopping private citizens from doing that and uploading them to commons for use out there. So in fact, what's really odd is that when I was talking to Smithsonian New Media people, they actually were very happy to see this project because they were handcuffed from filming their own content because of that contract they signed with a traditional cable TV channel, probably pre-internet. Um, so that's interesting. So our workforce of you know Wikipedia video shooters can have an important role in creating high quality video footage of these collections and museums that even the institution themselves are not allowed to do because of contract. So it's kind of a weird situation there. So here's just some examples of some of the videos that have been made um, by some of the students in those classes. This one is just very simple. I call this kind of tier one video. You just turn on the, turn on the video camera, put on a tripod, and just make your uh, dessert. So this was a uh, demonstration of how to make a Serbian dessert and was just showing the assembly of all the different components. Um, not great, you don't ever see the face of the person doing it, you don't ever have any close-ups, but it, it's at least a start. So this is kind of like the first generation of video that the Alverno students did. But then, if you start to go to some other types of videos, this is one that was done um, of the Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Art, which is a really cool sculpture there, and I filmed this inside of the museum well, there's just crazy, crazy sculpture. So this one is tough because I actually, after I filmed it, had to contact the artist to explain what I wanted to do and explain what CC by SA was. And it took him a few weeks of correspondence before he finally just said, oh yeah, that's cool, upload it. <laughs> but it, it takes a lot of work. And that's part of the process as well as educating students and other folks that, that um, what we call human social engineering, of having to approach folks who have the rights to release them in situations like this. Right? So this is great. I mean, if you go to the Chris Burden website, I'm sorry, the Chris Burden article, you would now have this visual of one of his best known pieces of art now. Yeah. Um, this is one of the better videos that was done later, oops, sorry. This is the video that was done later on of uh, how to make a spring roll. So this one was more sophisticated. It showed the finished product first, so you know what your goal is. And then here they panned across the ingredients and then they showed every single step um, along the way with close-ups, you know, um, transitions and different things. And by the end of this thing, you are salivating because it looks so good on camera. So that's, that's how good this video is. It's right there. So they got much more sophisticated in, in subsequent iterations when we showed them different angles and how to shoot different things. And then what was really cool is at Wiki Conference USA, I showed the audience there how quickly you could do this by actually shooting some video of um, the participants there. So for example, if you went to the article on unconference, there was no video there. Although a video of an unconference is not exactly the most scintillating video, but I will show you what we did. Um, we had one of the Wiki Pedians there be willing to be filmed. Let's see if we can show that real quick. An unconference is a participant driven meeting where the agenda is created by the attendees at the beginning of the event. Anyone who wants to initiate a discussion on a topic can claim a time and a space. Unconferences typically feature open discussions rather than having a single speaker at the front of the room giving a talk, although any format is permitted. All right, so that's that's more of like a radio thing, but you can actually have visuals that show that. So you can see the five shot method used there for that. And then if you, you don't have to follow those five shots. Those are good five shots that always edit together well as a story. Then what happens is you can start to mix those up 
in different ways because those five shots fundamentally can anchor the story. So if you go to the knitting page, which I thought really needed a, uh, a video, um, you now have a video on knitting and one of the speakers, one of the keynote speakers there was knitting in the corner and I said, let me shoot a video with you and interview you about what knitting's about. So this is that video that we made right there and then in about 10 minutes at the conference. Fundamentally, knitting is using the sticks of some sort to pull loops of yarn or other corded material through itself in order to produce fabric. It's a variant of netting in that it's one continuous strand, unlike something like weaving or, um, or braided materials. The two basic stitches are knits and pearls, and knits give the flat fabric like this. Pearls give, give the bumps and the, the more ridged fabric, and it's the opposite of, an, so this is, this is the pearl side, this is the knit side of stockinette. The trade-off between all of this mechanized, mass-produced products is that they're not individualist. When I'm done with this, I will have a pair of socks that fit my feet exactly. Okay, so that's a very simple video that we did very quickly, and, and it showed a lot of folks that this is not impossible to do. This is very something you could do right there and then with your mobile phone. Right, so I'm a big fan of the iPhone and Android devices of, uh, for people to shoot these things. You don't need high-end equipment for this kind of stuff. Right, so uh, so that I'm trying to get more folks to do that. And the reason why these experiments are important is because once people find patterns that work, you can actually post things that say, here, here's a pattern that we want for food, here's a pattern that we want for static objects, or here's a pattern that'll help you shoot static objects, here's a pattern that'll help you shoot human subject matters. And uh, this has been useful in training our students to say, you know, here's at least some kind of basic template you can use in the field. But as you get more experience, you can go off of the script and start doing your own shooting that's more imaginative. So let me go directly to the issues of why this is not just a nirvana of learning how to shoot and magically your video is on Wikipedia. Well, here's the problem. Open source standards are not widely used in the industry and because the only two formats that Commons accepts are WebM and AUG, um, we have a problem, right? We have a problem that uh, what you shoot on your iPhone, on your Android device, is not easily uploadable to Commons. In fact, on an iPhone or iPad, you cannot even view the videos I just showed you. It's just not playable. The iPad doesn't play WebM or AUG. Also, even if you could overcome this problem, there is no collaboration happening, right? I shoot all the footage, I've edited that knitting, uh, video. Um, I've got Sebastian back there and he says, oh, I can help improve this. I can do a better voiceover. I can do, sorry, that's just one blob of video. It's not broken down into audio tracks. It's not broken down into overlays or anything else. So that's a big problem. There's no collaboration going on here. So the big problem is obviously that the formats we use in the commercial world, MPEG-4, AVC-HD, what they call H.264, um, they have a long, long history of being embedded into our devices and our chips. They are so successfully embedded in these things that when you play video from Netflix or YouTube, whatever, the battery consumption is extremely low because the hardware on your cell phone has that support in there, right? So it is actually a huge advantage for these folks who have those standards baked into the chips here. That's a good thing for us for battery life. It's tough if you're dealing with a pure software solution, which is what we'd have to do for AUG and WebM. If you look at some of the other issues here, um, again, limited codec support in iOS devices, plugins needed. If you're using Chrome or Firefox, you're okay with using it on a laptop or a desktop, um, but still you're requiring someone to download and install something, something else, right? So the ubiquity of MPEG-4 and what we call H.264 codec is, is, um, is pretty astounding. It is pretty much in every device that we have, whether you've um, realized you're paying for it or not. Right. So support for MP4 in additional, in addition to MP, in to, oh, in, sorry, support for MP4 in addition to open formats. Well, mobile use of Wikimedia sites is now at 33%. During the hackathon, one of the developers said, projected out 10 years from now, maybe 50% of the folks using Wikipedia are going to be on mobile. Right. Uh, so that's a concern. Uh, one of the things that set the table for this is that we had a referendum earlier this year that said, well, what if we could support MPEG-4, which has never been a possibility before in Commons. Um, we did have this interesting quirk that the MPEG-LA, the licensing authority that 
you know, owns the patents and licenses it out, does not require a license for serving MP4s online if users are not charged for viewing those. So potentially we could put MP4s on commons and we would not have to pay the patent holders of MPEG4 anything. We'd have to pay zero dollars. We just could put the MPEG4s up and people could download them and or watch them on a website, right? Um, it's a little more complex than that, but that's the general gist of that, right? Um, Luis is like cringing back there. Basically true or not true? Um, no licensing fee required. No licensing fee. License still you need a free license, is that right? The so. foundation would have to sign a free license. Good, thanks for clarifying. So no cost license is what it would be. Um, Good. As, as I remember, there are fees for the audio format. Audio Good point. So depending on what audio format you use, that might be a case. That's correct. Yeah, right. that's correct, but those are relatively small. Right. Relatively small, but you know, but still, when we had the RFC earlier this year, um, this was the tally, right? So you had a bunch of folks say, yeah, let's do the full MP4 thing. You had some people say, if you can upload the MP4, transcode it, and not deal with the MP4 anymore, that's OK. But the majority of folks said, no MP4. I don't want to say ever, 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 but that was the sentiment of a lot of folks who voted there. So, right? so th that, that's the state of affairs that we have right now. What are some solutions to overcome this if we don't have MP4 support on there? Well. Um, there's a subpage created for comment. There hasn't been much activity on that since March, so I don't think there has been much follow-up to this. But we have had some conversations, so a few solutions here. So one is the Internet Archive already accepts MP4 files and automatically transcodes all of them to uh, AUG format. Now, it's not the highest quality that you'll find. So, for example, here, if you look at this page, this is, for example, one of the episodes of Wikipedia Weekly we uploaded the other day. The AUG video here is about an eighth of the size of the MP4, so it's not great quality, but it's there. One thing we could do is write some kind of script that sideloads that AUG file over into comments. So you have this interface that says upload to IA, they transcode it, get the AUG, bring it back into comments, suck in the metadata, and that's a better user experience than it is now. What's that? There is such a tool now, which is? Fire OGG. You're not talking about the Firefox plugin. Um, there's a, a, something built upon it to that. Right. You're talking about Firefox. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's the Firefox tool, which is part of Firefox, right? So you can you can do it on your own laptop. You need to download Firefox. You need to download that little plugin. From what I understand, you have to be connected to the internet. I don't know if you can operate Firefox while unconnected to the internet. You can't. Yeah, it's, which is really weird, because everything is on your laptop, but you still need access to the net. Anyway, the, the solution that might be part of this is to sideload this from Internet Archive and Fabrice, and a bunch of other folks have been talking to them. Another thing that I just mentioned is the last thing that SJ and I were talking about when we were walking here, is what if we had a space that was like a tools um, or a tool server type environment for media and content? So that we could actually play with stuff that wouldn't really be kosher on commons, um, whether it's fair use or licensing or codecs, or anything. but we can start to at least have some experiments going on. And we really don't have that right now, um, unless we do have one. Um, I'm not sure if there's someone put up a tool that you could upload a file that converts to from MP4 and then download onto a website. I don't know if you did it. I right. I saw that too. Right. I think we had the demo of that this morning, right? Yeah, he's here. He's, he's right there, so we should talk to him, too. But I think, you know, the same way that we have a tool server and a, a labs environment that has lots of developer uh, engagement, we should have that same type of environment for folks experimenting with video and multimedia. We really don't have that right now. So if we could do something like that, that'd be great. So uh, I just want to make a short statement. We're out of time. Mm -hmm. But uh, in general, the multimedia team would love to support video. Um, our plate is a little bit full this year, as you just heard earlier, but we're very committed to making video happen, and so maybe the following year we can start devoting more resources <laughs> to this. Uh, right now we're severely limited by the current situation <coughs> that uh, Andrew described, but obviously there's an amazing opportunity for us to use video to help people learn about the world. Um, Perhaps a, 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 be, a good beginning would be to partner with the Internet Archive and encourage people to upload there or to the media server that you mentioned right. and start the experiments. But more importantly, 
we encourage uh, everyone to start a discussion about how video can support our educational uses and start um, developing a cultural appreciation for the value of video <clears throat> and accepting it as a uh, equal citizen to text-based articles. Uh, it's very powerful and starting to develop a community of creators as well as curators who could potentially, once we get the tools in place, really grow this exponentially beyond where we are today. Yeah, and I welcome folks to go come visit the site and uh, sign up, contribute stuff. And then I think we're gonna hear from Brian, who's gonna describe some of his cool experiments on how to try to overcome some of the stuff we were just talking about. So, Brian, hand it to you. So while we give a few minutes to our new, to our next speaker, I just um, wanted to mention that we're a little bit um, behind the schedule. But well, since the, this is the last talk, and later we have lunch, we're gonna, you know, be flexible on that, and and yeah, let you later ask any questions you have or continue the discussion. So yeah, we're gonna talk now about freedom in motion, the state of open video and audio at Wikimedia. All right, hopefully I can actually get uh, connected to the Wi-Fi here. If it doesn't work, I do have a backup. Yeah. Yeah, it's looking better now. Yep, we're good. All right. This guy and all right, we're working. Okay, so as um, Andrew was pointing out earlier, oops, I need my water. There's always something. As Andrew was pointing out earlier, uh, we have a fun issue with codecs uh, and file formats. So what works right now? And what is the state of HTML video in general? Well, if you look on Wikipedia under HTML5 video, you get this giant table of support. Uh, you'll notice there are a lot of green spots, which are good. Uh, there are also a lot of red spots, some of which are bad. So if you look within these two columns, the Fiora and uh, the VP8 WebM, those are the formats that we support on Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons. Unfortunately, and there are basically two manufacturers or uh, two ven browser vendors that do not support them whatsoever. Uh, if you look on Internet Explorer and uh, Apple Safari, uh, you'll find that on desktop systems, you may be able to do manual installation of a Kodak and get it to work, uh, but that's something that's very difficult to actually get people to do. And on uh, more of the mobile devices, uh, such as Windows Phone, and of course iOS devices, uh, and even Windows RT tablets, which uh, there's a few out there, um, there is no way to install the manual codecs whatsoever. You're just screwed. You can't play them. Uh, so how did we get here? Well, way back in 2001, 2002, uh, when we first added uh, file upload capability to uh, Wikipedia, we found that a few people were starting to upload MP3 files. And we said, wait a minute, there's all kinds of weird patent things about MP3s. You know, we don't even want to touch that. Uh, at the time, we weren't even allowing uploads of GIF images, uh, which were still under the Unisys patents at the time. So we really didn't want to do MP3, which also uh, there were uh, active problems with enforcement of the patents. So we started accepting Og Vorbis video, uh, which, or audio, which uh, was a free codec uh, based on open source libraries and known to be uh, either free of patents or any patents involved were openly licensed. Uh, and generally, you could have a built-in plugin 
pretty much standard on Linux systems, but if you were on anything else, you probably had to go install something. It was kind of a pain in the butt, but it was something. So somewhere around 2005, 2006, we also started accepting uh, Og Theora video clips. Og Theora is um, a relative of Og Vorbis uh, in that it works in the same <coughs> container format and uh, is also uh, freely licensed patents. But it's a somewhat older generation video codec and uh, is not considered to be the best one available. But it was free. It was available to use, and it was something we could start using. Uh, and in order to provide playback in browsers, um, we were able to use a Java applet called Cortado, uh, which was created, I believe, by Fluendo. Um, and uh, it worked, mostly. However, Java has gotten to where it works less and less. So even though we still offer it on the site, uh, you'll generally find that it doesn't actually work. So back to history. In 2007, uh, Opera proposed the video tag for the new HTML5 standard. Uh, and they proposed uh, that Og Theora and Vorbis would be used as a minimum standard codec that everyone should implement because it was patent-free or rather patent unencumbered. Uh, and would be able to be implemented by anyone. And Opera and Firefox pretty quickly implemented it. Uh, after a while, Chrome did as well. Uh, however, it was very difficult to get this actually written into the spec uh, because in part, uh, in large part actually, uh, some of the members of the HTML spec committee were of course Microsoft and Apple who are major browser vendors and also have a financial interest in the MPEG-LA patent pool. So it turns out they were really interested in pushing MP4-based formats uh, and wanted nothing to do with uh, Og Theora. So eventually, the uh, vendors decided, OK, it's too useful to have the APIs for video and audio to not standardize on this but we can't get everyone to agree on a codec. So they agreed on a, a standard, but no codec. So you had uh, Apple and Microsoft's browsers implementing the same video element with MP4 family codecs, uh, Firefox uh, implementing only the OG codecs, and Google and Opera implementing both, uh, which was an interesting situation where basically you had to <coughs> do both formats in order to catch on browsers. Uh, in 2010, Google tried to uh, push to improve this situation. Uh, they had bought Onto's uh, VP8 codec, which was a later development of uh, the standard that Fiora had been originally based on, uh, and it was a much more advanced, more modern codec. Uh, and they released it as WebM, uh, using a different container format than OG, uh, which has some advantages, some disadvantages, but mainly just it's slightly different. Uh, but the video was much more effective, better compression and better quality in the same file size. Uh, Mozilla and Opera immediately promised support, as well as Google, uh, so they were quickly integrated into Chrome uh, and Firefox and Opera. Uh, Adobe also promised to add uh, support for WebM to Flash, however, it just never materialized. And Microsoft and Apple never hopped on the bandwagon uh, they did allow for installation of manual codecs, and uh, they actually did some special support. Uh, Microsoft did some special support in Internet Explorer to support uh, those codec installations, but you have to jump through the hoops of manual setup. Uh, in the meantime, over on the MediaWiki side, uh, we upgraded from an old OG handler extension, which was very specific to OG Media to uh, Timed Media Handler, which is much more advanced, uh, includes support for WebM and even optionally MP4 formats. Uh, and most importantly, it includes support for transcoding. So if you go to YouTube, for instance, or Vimeo, or any of these video hosting sites, you'll probably be familiar with the concept of different resolution selections. Uh, you're able to pull up something in high definition, or you're able to pull up the low-resolution version, whatever works for your screen size and your bandwidth. 
uh, because you don't always want to download the biggest high definition file. It uh, may not play back very well uh, on a slow device or a slow connection. And at the same time, you don't want to have small, tiny, crappy files when you have the ability to do uh, higher resolution. So being able to do transcodes meant that not only could we uh, automatically convert between AUG and WebM formats, um, but we could upload high definition originals and still have lower resolution versions for online viewing. And uh, we also figured out that it was fairly easy to add MP4 support to that. So the uh, ability to transcode to and from MP4 was actually added to Time Media support uh, a couple of years ago. Excuse me but uh, we were unable to decide on whether to enable it. And uh, as was, uh, you saw earlier, uh, there was an RFC on it last year, uh, earlier this year, and just didn't quite agree on it. So, oh well. So what can we do to work around that? So at some point last year, uh, I was thinking about this problem, and uh, while we were working on trying to get the uh, license issues with the patent stuff worked out, uh, I also did some experiments on what could we do if that wasn't going to be enough, if that wasn't going to work. Uh, so I figured out that uh, modern JavaScript engines are actually very fast. Uh, ever since Chrome came out, uh, the browser wars have emphasized very much JavaScript performance. And it turns out that you can actually do decoding of uh, audio and video in these modern systems just like we were able to do in uh, the Java applet several years ago. So I did a little research on that, started it going, and uh, when I found, or when we found that uh, the RFC for MP4 didn't go through, I put some more work into it. Uh, so first, quick overview of what was that Java applet. So we set it up long, long ago, uh, I think around 2006, 2007, um, it is unfortunately no longer maintained. Uh, it's old code. Uh, there are problems with compatibility with newer versions of Java. Uh, the code signing on it is actually broken. Um, some of us are looking at trying to fix it, uh, and hopefully we can get it working again. But uh, right now, you basically have to have an old version of Java or jump through some hoops to disable a bunch of security stuff, and then it works. And that's not cool. That's not what we want. Uh, it's not maintained, in fact, to the point where the former maintainers of it are sending me patches on my new work. Uh, so we really don't want to rely on the old software because nobody wants to maintain it. The basic problem with uh, Java, uh, the Java applet was just ecosystem rot. Uh, Java has become less popular over time, so fewer people have it installed. Uh, there have also been more and more security problems discovered in the Java applet over time, so it's frequently disabled by default. Uh, and in fact, it's totally unavailable on, for instance, uh, iOS devices, there's no Java. No Java at all. Android devices are based on a sort of weird version of Java, but no Java applets. So again, nothing there. Uh, and they also, uh, the Java applet also uses old plugin technologies and uh, ends up just doing weird things when you embed it. You can't overlay graphics or controls on top of it. It just doesn't work right. So let's look in a little more low detail, a uh, low level detail on what is multimedia playback. So basically you have a container stream, which is your file, uh, and through the process of demuxing, uh, you take packets of data out of that in one or more streams. Usually, there'll be an audio stream and a video stream. You send those down into decoders of the appropriate formats, and they give you back either some sort of linear PCM audio data for audio, or usually uh, YUV uh, data for video, uh, which then has to be converted to RGB for actual display. Uh, so in the process of playback, you also have to sort of check the timestamps on all those packets, make sure they're in sync, and then you can output them at the proper time. So there are a few pieces that actually have to be put together to make something work. Um, now sometimes those pieces are already provided for us. 
Uh, so for instance, the low-level codecs are provided by zif.org uh, ZIF libraries, um, libog, lib, uh, vorbis, and libtheora. Uh, they're open source, uh, I believe BSD style license. Uh, they're distributed widely in browsers and operating systems that do support them, such as uh, Firefox, Android, Chrome. Uh, and then there are higher level multimedia frameworks, for instance, VLC Kit, uh, or LibVLC, depending on the platform, or the GStreamer library, uh, which take those and other codecs and combine them into a high level system for you. Now, the nice thing about those high level frameworks is that they do a lot for you. They're already available on a lot of standard OSs. There's commercial support available even, uh, but they tend to be kind of big. Uh, which for a mobile app can increase the size of your app. They're not currently available for the web, uh, except as plugins. And sometimes there's some worries about licensing uh, because either they include uh, patent encumbered codecs by default, for instance, uh, VLC, or uh, there are some questions about the LGPL license on uh, GStreamer, which may be an issue for uh, some app distribution. So I don't really want to scare Luis with uh, all this stuff uh, because legal could uh, not be super pleased by it. But those low level frameworks are perfect. They're known to be using non patent encumbered formats. They're lightweight, they're very small. Uh, and it turns out that they're actually easy to cross compile for the web. The only bad part is you have to do some of that synchronization and the actual output yourself. But it turns out that's not too hard. So I was able to put together a combination, uh, which I call OGVJS, uh, which supports Vor uh, Vorbis Audio and Fiora Video. Uh, it uses the Aug, Vorbis, and Fiora libraries as they are. Uh, I believe I have one tiny patch on Fiora to fix a compilation error. And other than that, they just work. Um, I'm able to use uh, Web Audio, which is a relatively new standard in the HTML5 family. Uh, for audio output in Safari. Uh, it also works in Chrome and Firefox, but of course you don't need it in Chrome and Firefox because they speak Aug and Web natively. Uh, and I can even accelerate the YUV color space conversion using WebGL, uh, which gives uh, web applications direct access to OpenGL ES um, uh, GPU acceleration. And it turns out to be not too difficult to set up basic sync with um, checking the uh, information output from the uh, libraries and using appropriate timers. So I also have another experiment, which is basically the same thing built for iOS natively. Um, so this is the exact same thing, but uses the native audio queue services and OpenGL ES for the audio and video output, uh, but can link into an iOS app natively. So um, the tool that I use to build these for JavaScript is called Imscripten. Uh, it's created by uh, or sponsored by Mozilla, uh, and they've been pushing it a lot for porting of games to the open web platform. Uh, so for instance, they've pushed integration of uh, OpenGL with automatic translation to WebGL and all kinds of fancy things. Uh, although I've actually sidestepped a lot of that to use just a very minimal C wrapper around a native JavaScript implementation of the audio and video. Uh, but in scripting based materials, uh, uh, programs basically work with any modern browser that supports what's called typed arrays, um, which allows you to emulate the C native memory model uh, within the web. And that's what I just told you. Ah, yes, in scripting is based on uh, the Clang or Clang, however you pronounce it, uh, compiler, which is uh, built on the LLVM front end. Uh, so it basically, in theory, can take other languages as well as C, but we only care about C here. Why not native JavaScript? Because I would have to port everything manually. Um, and that would be very difficult. Uh, it would be doable. But that would lead to a lot of the same kinds of uh, maintenance problems that we had with the Java version, where no one really knew how it worked and uh, it didn't get updated properly. So this way, we're able to use the upstream libraries and just compile them. And any fixes that go into the upstream libraries, we get automatically. 
So um, it actually works very well in desktop Firefox, Chrome, and Opera, and in Android browsers. However, you don't need it because they already play AUG and WebM natively. Uh, but they're great for uh, testing. The real targets are IE and Safari. No IE6, I guess. No IE6 currently, although I actually have, and I will get to this very shortly, I have a Flash version that might work in IE6. So I will do some experiments on that. So on Internet Explorer 10 and 11, you're actually able to do all the JavaScript decoding, but there's one thing missing, and that's audio support. Uh, so that either has to use a thin flash shim, uh, which unfortunately is very bad for performance, or you just go back to the all flash version, which uh, has somewhat lower overhead. Uh, but a future version of Internet Explorer should include the web audio interface, uh, which Microsoft says is in development. And uh, if I have the chance to give them feedback, I will beg them to do it faster. Uh, and then there's Safari, which amazingly has web audio already built in. And the uh, next versions actually also have WebGL for further acceleration on the audio. So current versions of Safari on uh, OS 10, 10.8 and up, and iOS 7 and up uh, will just play this back natively, or no, not natively, but JavaScriptly. Uh, so these actually work on iOS as well. Um, if you're on a slower 32-bit device, video is a little slow. It kind of has to run low resolution to be fast enough, but audio works great. And audio is actually more important right now because we have audio in more articles for uh, music clips, pronunciation guides, things like that. Uh, so that was sort of my first experiment, and then I was hoping I could get video to work, and uh, video works, which pleases me. Uh, in theory, uh, it could work on Windows Phone, but it doesn't work right now because of that limitation of missing the web audio. Uh, so I also have a uh, OGV.SWF, which is a Flash version. Uh, and this is using the exact same infrastructure, most of the same code, uh, simply built using uh, Adobe's CrossBridge compiler <coughs> instead of uh, Mozilla's Inscripting compiler. Uh, it turned out to be relatively easy to port. So right now I'm actually using the Flash version for Internet Explorer because it performs a little better. So let me go ahead and show what it looks like. So if you go to some video page on comments in, say, this is Chrome, and you try to play, it will actually work. That's nice. That's a WebM. It's playing natively. It's great. But let's go over here to Internet Explorer. Same file. You hit play. It just offers to download the file. That's useless, especially if you don't have something installed that could actually run it. And uh, in Safari, there we go. This is Safari. Same thing. It has this little help message. And you push play, and nothing works. Not cool. So I have the same file uh, on a MediaWiki instance with Time Media Handler and OGVGS plugged in. And you push the button. It loads up. Please tell me it loads up. Yes, Yay. and it works. Yay. So this is a video file. Uh, it's running Og Fiora. Uh, there's also a WebM version, uh, but we don't have the decoder working yet. Uh, but it will require more CPU than Fiora, so I'm concentrating on uh, Fiora for now. Um, but of course, what about Internet Explorer? So Internet Explorer should also, hopefully, very soon. <laughs> there we go. So you can see this is actually running the Flash version. Uh, if you want to amuse yourself, you can, uh, you know, pull up the Flash version and all that crap. Uh, you can even zoom in. 
I don't know why Flash has that feature. It's the most useless thing ever. But uh, it works exactly the same. Uh, it's totally transparent and integrates into uh, the menu system. So for instance, uh, oops, let's go over to Chrome where there's actually uh, an ability to have multiple things. Oops. So, uh, for instance, uh, ooh, these menus are kind of hard to read, but uh, you can select either the native AUG player or the JavaScript AUG player as an option, uh, if you are so inclined. But uh, usually you would only use one or the other. So, then I found that on mobile, uh, the situation was actually a little more dire, uh, because even when um, things were supported natively, for instance on Android, most of the time the player uh, was not fully integrated. Uh, the pop-up players, for instance, did not pop up. They would give you a thumbnail and a link to the original file, uh, which was really not cool if it was a high, defini uh, high definition original. Uh, so I've done some work on integrating uh, the player for Time Media Handler into the mobile environment as well. So we have something that looks like this. Hopefully. Click. There we go. So I basically stole the template of the photo viewer uh, and slightly modified it and uh, had it load up the JavaScript stuff. So this is the iOS simulator. Uh, it has all the exact same abilities as an iOS device. And if you really want, I can show you on a real iPhone or iPad later. Uh, this playback, it does actually work. Uh, there's even audio. Here's the result of reasoned engineering. Awesome. So I have that now uh, in Garrett as a work in progress patch, uh, and I would love more contributions. Uh, if anyone's interested in helping with, uh, especially the mobile integration, making it work a little nicer, uh, I'm hoping to continue work on that over the next few weeks, and hopefully we can actually get it deployed uh, sometime in the next few months. Uh, and that'll give us a nice stopgap for basic playback. Uh, and then sometime next year, uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to do a lot more uh, active video work, knowing that everyone will be able to play back. How much time do I have left? Five minutes, awesome. Ah. The energy impact of having to do all that, how much it drains your battery? That's an excellent question. Uh, on a iPhone 5S, um, medium resolution video takes about 20, 25% CPU to, run, uh, to decode. Uh, which actually appears to be not too bad, according to the uh, energy um, instruments uh, in Xcode, that's one of the lower power usage levels. Uh, and it should actually also improve in iOS 8 because it'll be able to use WebGL to use the, GP, the GPU for some of the video decoding, uh, specifically the YUV uh, uh, to RGB conversion. Uh, so there are also some other possibilities. Um, which I've totally forgot to include a slide on. But in addition to the decoder, these libraries do encoding as well. Uh, it should actually be relatively straightforward to introduce a uh, interface that allows us to encode video, which may or may not make it possible to do client-side transcoding of MP4 videos, but I'm gonna have to do a lot more research into that uh, because getting the video out of MP4 is hard. Uh, without shipping our own decoder, because we have to see if we can make use of the browser itself. But what is going to be possible is generation of video in the client side. So for instance, you can have a gadget tool that uh, takes a subclip of a larger clip, um, maybe mixes a couple things together, overlays uh, some titles, uh, and then encodes that back into Augur WebM and uploads it directly. Um, so that should help with moving towards actually being able to do more collaborative editing of video. Uh, so I'm really hoping to do more experimentation on that in the coming year. And hopefully I'll have something really awesome to show you next year. Uh, questions? Um, apart from never using Microsoft Apple uh, products, would this be a good 
world? Yes. Um, being able to do the encoding as well as the decoding means that uh, we can do video manipulation. Uh, so we can download some of that WebM video that we already have uploaded. We can manipulate it, change the uh, um, color levels, for instance, uh, mix two shots together, add titles, add subtitles, um, overlay new audio, and then re-encode it in the browser. Um, so that lets you do potentially very flexible things and still be um, not having to ship everything back to the server in order to manipulate it. Exactly. And hopefully that can actually work with offline stuff as well. Uh, a lot of the newer browsers have pretty good support for uh, index DB or other kinds of offline storage. Uh, so we should actually be able to download a file from commons, store it locally as a cached object, manipulate it offline, encode it offline, and then upload it when you're done. So uh, yeah, there's some really cool possibilities. Yes? So probably I just missed that. But um, just to be really clear on the way you, you've been working on adding support for browsers which mm -hmm. lack just basic video support, playback support, when should we expect to see that live? So for current versions of Safari and uh, Internet Explorer 9 and up, uh, hopefully we can see that in the next couple of months. Um, I have code that seems to work pretty well. I just need some more people to test on it, and uh, we can start integrating it pretty soon. So this summer, uh, it hopefully should be ready by the end of the summer, which is pretty soon. <laughs> Any more questions? I think I'm almost out of time. Over there. Related, but if I want a modified playback, mm. that plays five seconds mm -hmm. uh, and then plays seconds one to six, and then plays seconds mm. two to seven, so that I have time to transcribe the audio. That's a good question. Is that possible or easy to accomplish? Uh, that should be very easy actually to accomplish with the native audio playback. Uh, there are some difficulties with seeking on the JavaScript system right now, uh, which is mainly due to limitations in the ability to stream the file. Um, but yes, hopefully we can rig something up that uh, will make it a lot easier to do transcription. So thanks for raising that. That is a very interesting subject. Any other last questions? Yes. Uh, you know, I'm about VP9. Oh yes, VP9. Yes. So uh, Google is working on the next version of their codex for WebM, uh, which is VP9, which is an enhancement of VP8. Uh, currently, I don't have any support for it in the JavaScript, but it should come automatically um, once I add the WebM support, because it's built into the same library as VP9 support. Uh, we are planning, in general, on supporting VP9 at some point in the future. Uh, it's not quite ready to go yet. Um, Google's still tweaking a few last bits, uh, but I believe it's pretty stable now. Uh, so we'll be able to enable transcoding of that. Uh, that will give uh, better quality at the same file size. Uh, and it should just work pretty transparently, uh, the same way that selection of AUG versus WebM already works. Uh, VP9 is also going to be very interesting for mobile because we know that uh, Android is mandating hardware VP9 support for uh, future Android support, uh, or Android devices. Uh, so th that will enable hardware accelerated playback for a lot of people's devices. Uh, and that's a big plus, because uh, we know uh, also the ability to encode directly to VP9 should mean that we can do very high quality uh, uploads directly from mobile devices. So we're very interested in that. That's still coming, uh, but yes. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for being such a